Joining me now here on the Knicks Film School podcast, a man who, at least to me, needs no introduction, yet I think I'm going to do one anyway, senior national writer for Fox Sports. You can find him on Good Morning Football, America's number one morning <laughs> football show on the NFL Network, uh, weekdays at 7 and on Saturdays at 9. Uh, you can find him on NFL Sunday kickoff throughout the season, as well as on an NFL sideline that Fox deems him appropriate to cover. You can also find him. Here's a throwback, Pete. Uh, co-author. Yes. If you're a Giants fan of Victor Cruz's autobiography, Out of you the Blue. It. I do you have, have it. it. Yes, I have Amazing. it with me right here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter Schrager. Peter, yes. welcome to the Knicks Film School podcast. Dude, thank you. The fact you actually have the book, you weren't <laughs> just reading off of Wikipedia and no. the real deal. Uh I am a football reporter slash analyst by day and a hoop head at night. Um, I am so honored to be coming on. Let's chop it up because I got takes, I got thoughts, and I got memories to unload. You got takes and memories. So I'll, I'll start with the behind the scenes. Uh, shout out to one Mr. David Pearl Nutter, Captain Pearl, to those of you on Nick's Twitter who know of him. Uh, one of our patrons in front of the pod who you are a mutual friend of and uh, who recommended you to us. And basically what he said to me was if there was a crossover of any kind that we should try to figure it out. So when I texted you, like, would you be interested in coming on a Knicks pod? And I quote, I want to talk about the 1990s Knicks. So I'm going to kind of give you the floor here. And I guess, where do you want to start with the 90s Knicks? First of all, Captain Pearl, what is it? Captain Pearl NYK, I think on Twitter is his name, yes. David Perlmutter is a sick basketball player really the hoop in the city and like has this crazy pull up quick release. We'll shoot it from anywhere. It's about six foot three and can ball. Now he's in his forties now. So it's not like it was in his twenties when I was playing with him, but nasty has bad ankles. Other than that, he's a baller. And uh, when we really became friends, we were playing in adult league basketball and he is a diehard Knicks fan to the point where you see on Twitter, this dude tweets all day during the games. And he's raising his son to be a Knicks fan, taking him to games and all that stuff. But one of my favorite things, we would just go down the wormhole of like, do you remember the series against the Pacers? But not the oh, LJ no. series. <laughs> Years earlier where John Starks is headbutting Reggie Miller. Like, I feel like MSG does a good job going down that path and giving us those classic games. But that was when I was in middle school and when I was in high school, the mid to late 90s. And it was like, Give me Marv, give me John Andres, and uh, let's get to the to Madison Square Garden and let's go. And on Sunday afternoons, it was like, all right, we've got the czar and we've got Marv and you've got uh, Peter Vesey in the studio because you knew the Knicks were going to be on national TV. And uh, it's been about 20 years since they've been as relevant as that, but I still have such a fondness for those Knicks years. Never got the ring, but like always relevant. And from Anthony Bonner to Anthony Mason to oh, Tony wow. Ward and... Orlando Blackman, I go deep and uh, I love those Knicks teams. So then I have to, I guess, just ask which, and this is unfortunate that this is how I somewhat remember the 90s Knicks, but which loss is the most painful? Is it the finger roll? Is it Charles Smith? Is it 94? Is it the nine men, one mission? Is it uh, anything from the 99? one one mission was so effed up because, you know, like they, <laughs> You had the series, and mm -hmm. then now we got. I want to say it was like Herb and Buck Williams starting in that in that final, you know, game six and game seven. And you're like, well, wait, 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 wait. We've taken the heat all this way, but the one that hurts the most has to be the '94 game seven, and it's because you had the edge going to Houston. You go down there, you're up three games to two. You lose game six, fine, and then Starks, who has been such a stalwart for the last several years, and had this amazing story from. From, you know, the grocery store, you know, bagging, shopping bags and groceries. And then to have him be the goat at the end and not in a good way. It's like, no, 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 it's not supposed to go that way. Starks is our guy. Like, supposed to live and die with Starks. And yet for him to have that game in game seven, was, and I remember it, it was on a, I want to say it was on a Saturday night. And it was like, it was so deflating. And then you think, all right, well, next year we'll get back. And then it doesn't happen because the Pacers, whatever. Then the next year we'll get back. And then that suddenly the Heat and the Bulls are back in the mix. And it's like. 94 to go up in that series three to two and head down to the summit down in Houston and to not seal the deal. It's like one of those great regrets. The only uptick on that was like, that was the greatest like June of our lives oh, yeah. of that generation. I was in sixth grade at the time. And it was like, 
Rangers win, Knicks win. Rangers win, Knicks win. Rangers go on the road to Vancouver, Knicks go down and they win. And, you know, it was just like an amazing ride. So you've heard about the spring of 94, Mike and the Mad Dog jumping back and forth and going to each place. Like it was that cool, especially uh, back in the day when there weren't a million options online and on Twitter. And it was like, you're just watching football, basketball and hockey. You're speaking so many of my love languages right now. Bring it up, Mike and the Mad Dog. Talking, about, I'm a Rangers fan too. Yeah. They're like Rangers are the only professional team as a fan of of at least that has won a team, won a championship in my lifetime as a Jets, Knicks, and Mets fan. Yep. So that '94 season obviously means a lot to me. It's funny you bring up the the almost of them winning a championship and then pointing out like they never got that close again. Mm-hmm. I mean. Is that like the biggest takeaway? I don't know if you read Chris Herring's book, uh, Blood and... I'm going to assume you read Chris. I've read it and I love his work. And I'm going to date myself. He used to write for the journals. He used to write for the Wall Street Journal. No, so he works... um, Oh, this is probably bad. Oh, it's Sports Illustrated now. He's Sports Sports Illustrated now. He went from to ESPN 538 because he left the Knicks beat. Got and it. then he now he's he doing more national stuff. For a while and I did read the book. I got an advanced copy. I was like, this is right up my alley. Um, Yeah. Yeah, look, like you go back in the day and, you know, they went to the finals again, I want to say in 99 in the lockout season, but it never Mm -hmm. felt like that season was even like as legit as the 94 one. And there's all these different examples. Now, before 94, of course, they're up two games to to nothing against the Bulls. And you're like, all right, if Charles Smith finishes that layup, whatever, maybe things change differently. But it was Jordan. Like Jordan was always this like giant, giant, like hovering, like with Jordan out of the league. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, gosh, I look back on that series and I look back on all those, you know, 94 and 95 to a point, like that little window that the Knicks had, Um, you know, but Riley leaving was a heartbreaker. And then I guess Van Gundy takes over and it's like, okay, it's fine. And that, that, those teams weren't as much mine as those Riley Knicks because there was attitude and energy and like, you didn't want to fuck with Xavier McDaniel. Like you knew you're coming to the lane, like Mason's going to knock you down and Mason didn't just talk to talk. He walked the walk. And then to have Oakley on our side and not on the Bulls, like you had bullies on this team. And Ewing was tough as shit. Like Ewing was good. Ewing was, uh, I mean, we, we, we lionize him now, but like Ewing was clutch. And I know he missed the finger roll and people were like, well, he never got it done. Ewing was that dude. And then those guards, whether it be Derek Harper or it be Rolando Blackman or it be whoever, even Mark Jackson before that, like there was a toughness and a bit of a yapping. And I loved Ro Blackman and Mark Jackson because they also represented New York. You know, mm-hmm. these guys, Mason was a New Yorker. Like these guys came out there and it was, they repped the streets. Like you knew where they were coming from. So I just, there was a cool identity and you throw in the, you know, go New York, go New York, go. And the whole thing, like it was a time to be alive. And I know a lot of Knicks fans are younger now and they're, they're repping the team. And I love the videos that got viral after, you know, last year's <laughs> season opener. Or even don't say it. Don't say big. Just don't say bing bong is all I ask. No, I'm not even going down there. I know okay, it, but, good. Like, but I know that there's like this passion and there's yeah, like, yeah. it's like a brimming optimism of like, this is it. Like, yeah, just trust me. It, it'll come again and it will be, you guys have earned it. And, and I say that you guys almost like I'm like the, third person because I'm not as involved now as I used to be, but like I lived and died with those Knicks in those early nineties. And a lot of my life memories uh, from my high school and middle school years were tied, tied to those games. So we have a, a kid that just turned 20 that started out as an intern. Now he's kind oh, of a, a host as one of our, our draft shows. Um, his name's Chris. And he, like, I always wonder why someone in their twenties, or at least that's just turned 20, what drove, what, what drew you to the Knicks? Cause yeah. you don't have what I have. Like I have the nineties to go back yes. to remember when that is. And it's why I, I hold as, as much as it's caused more problems now, probably that sure. 2021 season that just happened, the we here year. It's why I hold it probably in more esteem than it probably should be because that now hey. gave a generation of young Knicks fans the chance to understand what it's like when the Knicks are good. And when dude, they're, they when lost they're hosting a playoff series. To one. Right. They it won one like, playoff game. <laughs> yeah. I was at that playoff game. Yeah. And the garden was electric. And yeah. I never went to the games when I was a kid. Like I didn't have like that access to like in there, but like I got to that game and you know, the whole Trey Young thing was kind of cool. It felt like Reggie a little bit, but like for those Knicks fans that are 20 years old, and I'm not sure what your connection is, whether it goes back to loving the way Gallinari used to shoot threes <laughs> or you were big on Chris Childs, punching Kobe, whatever it was, 
that generation, that younger generation, like, I think it's so cool that there's such a diehard fan base considering 20 years of terrible basketball, with yeah. the one exception of that one Carmelo year where they made a little run. I, so I also hold the mellow. I'm, I'm very much the mellow stand of this channel yeah. and of this, of this pod. So I hold that mellow year as a little more high regard than like a one-off. I granted what happened the next year was so tumultuous mm. that it was tough to defend that there was any type of longstanding run there, but you're right. Like it, it, it's just not the nineties. Like every year we were wondering how far into the playoffs they'd go, not what they make the playoffs. Um, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. It was just the last point on that era. There was an aesthetic to it. Like mm -hmm. you would watch MSG and it was like, Holy shit. We're watching the Knicks at the garden. And it had the same font, the same look, the same announcers, and then you go to the weekend games and I mentioned this, but it was like, it was a big deal. I don't, you know, ESPN is a competitor now. I'm at NFL network and I appreciate their coverage and TNT does a fine job on their Thursday night stuff. But like those Sundays when you, you know, you'd have the early game would be the Knicks against somebody, it'd be the mm -hmm. Bulls or it would be the Pacers or the Heat. And then it would be like the late afternoon game from the key arena. And it's, you've got, the, you know, Tom Hammond is here with Steve Snapper Jones and we're watching Sonics Blazers and you didn't see Sonics Blazers all week long, or you didn't see the Phoenix Suns with Barkley and Marley. Yeah. And it was just like Sunday afternoon. You, you, you do your cartoons in the morning, your rec soccer, mm. whatever you got. And then you were locked and loaded on NBC and that music, the John Tesh. Round ball rock. Yep. Such a feel and time and thing. And then the NBA playoffs, it was like, you throw the remote away. Like, that's what I'm watching. So I hate to go down memory lane, but it was just a different time. No, I believe me as someone who grew up in that and became a fan in that. I, I appreciate it. Um, so you said you were in sixth grade for the 94 yeah. season. So like obviously someone who knows your career and has seen you, what's your, your career has, I guess, ascended to at this point. My question about fandom has, I've always been fascinated. Like I used to host a show where it was like more of an, a, a final interview where I wanted to find out where prominent journalists, like yeah. when, when you went from being a fan of sports to now I cover this, this is work. Do you have a moment when you were watching sports, not no longer as a fan, did it click off right away once you got your first job? Interesting question. I grew up a uh, Giants fan mm -hmm. in the NFL, and I'm not affected when the Giants lose anymore, like at all. Yet when they do win, there's a part of me that just feels great for the fans that I grew up with and like my friends that like live and die Giants. But the second you start covering this, it goes from being teams to like rooting for your people. And when I say mm. people, it's not necessarily inside sources, but it's people who have opened doors for you. It's people that have been good to you and it's players that have always treated you with respect and they're all over the league. So I, I, I whatever, you know, Sean McVay and I did a podcast last year for uh, uh, flying coach. It's flying amazing. Coach. You should go find it if you haven't heard it yet. It's a cool concept. And it started with actually Steve Kerr and Pete Carroll doing it for Bill Simmons. And then Simmons and I were talking and McVeigh and I have been close friends for more than a decade. And he was willing to dip his toe in it. And we interviewed 10 different head coaches. So, you know, McVeigh becomes not only a friend, but a brother. And all of a sudden, so like when he's playing against the Giants, I have no great relationship with necessarily Pat Shermer, you know, like, so I'm rooting for Sean and his success. And of course I'm invested in that, but it's all from 30,000 feet. I'm not supposed to take sides. I don't have like, but when you see your people win and the guys that have been good to you win and like, I love Todd Bowles, right? I love Todd Bowles. I've known him for years when he was with the jets. Like I thought he might've gotten a raw deal there at the end. Like, so to see him with Tampa, like there's a place in my heart for the Bucks, And it's not because I grew up rooting for the creamsicle Buccaneers and John Lynch and Ronde Barber. It's because like, I'd like to see Todd Bowles in his second shot at head coach, you know, have a couple, a couple wins on his side and, you know, let's get another shot at it. So you root for the people more than the teams, but you better believe like the fact, the fact that I grew up with giants and jets fans and what they've been through the last decade. Like I would love to see both those fan bases have some success this year. I have five minutes at the end dedicated to asking you why I should have any hint of optimism as a Jets fan. So wow. we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so 
part of that interview series, like I, Anthony DeComo covers the Mets, like grew up a Yankee fan, and he got to write the pinnacle book that's the autobiography of David Wright, something yeah. he probably never thought he'd do. Uh, Howard Beck, who covers the NBA, uh, I think he's also now at Sports Illustrated. Um, he grew up in Northern California, and he talks about like growing up idolizing Jerry Rice and Joe Montana. And then the day he got to meet them, he stopped for a second being a reporter. Like imagine so telling, cool. imagine telling 10 year old Howard that I'd one day meet Jerry Rice or Joe Montana in a, in a formal capacity. Do you have a moment like that where it was someone you grew yeah. up idolizing that you met? I don't geek out at the football uh, mm -hmm. or basketball guys. Like it's oddly enough. And I think you can appreciate this based on the, the people you've interviewed and such esteemed journalists. Like, I freak out when I meet Jim Nance. Oh, okay. I freak out. I freak out when Troy Aikman shouts me out on air because I said something good on Good Morning Football. I I love that I have you know relationships with some of the broadcasting guys over the over the course of my career, like Kenny Albert, who's obviously Marv's son. I went to Fox, and we were just in LA for a big Fox event, and Kenny and I talked for twenty minutes about the '94 Cup and you know how he was working as a you know, the young cub, like radio guy doing that game and how he met his wife. And I was like, that's the shit I geek out on. Mm -hmm. I, I met Barry Sanders. I thought that was awesome. Lawrence Taylor, I got to meet at a young age when I was doing inside the NFL and it was like surreal. Um, but I don't necessarily have that for the players because I never thought I could be a player. But when, you know, I, the first time I met, uh, you know, James Brown, I thought that was awesome because oh, wow. I grew up watching James Brown and I'm like, Okay, now I'm in the same kind of room as James Brown, and uh, and you know, so I not to flatter them all too much because they're all colleagues and uh, contemporaries, but it's the broadcasting guys and the sports writers, um, Bill Simmons included, who I'm working with now. Who I know he's got a lot of critics, but shit, when I was in college, the reason I'm doing journalism now is because I was addicted to his voice and the way he wrote about sports. And I think a lot of the sports bloggers and a lot of us on Twitter and all that stuff um, where you can kind of blend the fandom with the objective uh, commentary. I think that comes from Simmons. So to meet all these guys, that that's where it's at for me. It's one thing that, that we've tried to do well here at Nick's film school, like try to blend objectivity and like, yes, you're, you're coming here because we are a Nick's, fan run site, but like we try to be as objective as possible about our coverage. Um, a couple of weeks ago, our, our normal host, John, he's the biggest Zach Lowe fan that's ever existed. Yeah. And we had him on for episode 500 and just like seeing him swoon throughout that is, you know, a similar situation. And I'm All sure bets are off if I ever have a chance to meet Francesa. I'm just going to throw that out really? there now. Yeah. Let's make it happen. I like, know listen, Francesa, if you make that make happen, happen. <laughs> really. we'll connect you. He would love to come on, I'm sure. Okay. Mike, um, friend, come on the pod, Mike. Okay. Make, Back that's after my this. one gift to you. I'll at least get you in touch with the right people who can make that happen. As far as Mike actually doing it, I'm not sure. That's but the I other part. I, yeah, we I might have to. <laughs> um, but I bet you Zach Lowe was flattered and honored to meet you guys and probably has five people, whether it be Bob Ryan or Will McDonough or whoever he grew up reading mm -hmm. that like he would say it. So to me, that's the cool shit. Um, yeah, it's fun seeing Saquon and it's great to work alongside, you know, I work alongside Michael Irvin and uh, I'm going to be doing a show on Sundays this fall with Charles Woodson, Mike Vick and Sean Payton, who individually, all three of those guys, I really revere their NFL stories and careers. Um, but that's not like, oh, wow. Like I finally got to meet Mike Vick. To me, it's, Oh my God, over there, that's Ian Eagle. You know, yeah, like that's what yeah. I get excited about. <laughs> yeah. We're, I feel like we're cut from the same cloth because the players I got over quickly, and it was the, the broadcasters and the people that are the actual people I idolized that, yeah. you know, I got to. You said you have NBA takes, and we're recording this on Tuesday at around two o'clock. Kevin Durant this morning um, announced that he's going back to Brooklyn, or I guess the Nets announced that he's going back to Brooklyn. It's funny how they, I love how Mark Berman worded it that. Only the Nets would like drop a press release that the guy already under contract is coming back, right? Yeah. With the boardroom stamped on it too. I don't want to turn this into two anti Nets, but also well, my well, first question: because of your intel, do do you have any crossover with NBA sources yeah. and NBA? Okay, so how much did today surprise you, and like how much behind the scenes do you know about this? Stuff? So it's funny because like that Shams 
he comes out on draft night in the NFL and sometimes will be like, sources tell me, and it's a, you know, he's got a kind of, I'm like, stay in your lane, bro. Like, <laughs> I, I could do a little bit of that in the NBA. I, I know my place. Uh-huh. I'm not dropping any bombs, but I actually, uh, living in Brooklyn, I've uh, become close with a lot of the folks with the Nets organization. And before, you know, they brought in KG uh, and Pierce and all those guys, when it first was like, you know, Brooklyn's coming, like, it, back in the old days with uh, what's his name as the owner. I couldn't even tell you his name right now. Uh, Prokhorov. Prokhorov. Yeah. It was like cool to like be like, all right, I'm going to give these. I know there's a Knicks Nets thing and it all goes back to LeBron and billboards and Jay-Z and all this stuff, whatever. Fine. But when no one was going to those Nets games, I would be going to those Nets games because I wanted to see NBA games. Um, this new version, they're really good. They're not very likable. Like mm-hmm. it's hard to like, Say, okay, I grew up in New Jersey, which I did and had a place in my heart for Kenny the Kid Anderson and Derek Coleman and Petro and Sam Bowie and Ron Anderson and like those those Nets teams of the 90s. And then to be like, oh, so it's Durant, Harden, Kyrie and the cast of characters that are all coming along as strap hangers for this ring. And then Harden wants out. Kyrie, you don't know if he wants out or wants to be there, doesn't want to be there. This Durant thing, like, the last 60 days, what, what was that? Like yeah. what? So then today to be like, just kidding. I'm not trying to fire the GM and head coach. They're my guys. Like who in their right mind wants to root for that whole situation. So I just, you know, as a Brooklyn guy and Patty Mills was around the corner, I see him. He's like, he lives here. Like mm-hmm. that's cool. Like to me, like the fact that Nash lives in the neighborhood and he lives in Brooklyn and I see Nash and his kids, like, that's awesome. I want to root for the Nets in a little bit of a way to see like, they're cool for New York, like to have the Knicks and Nets. Mm-hmm. But like, if Durant wins a championship with the Nets, like who's like, a, I don't know, like who, wh- where's the heart there when he just tried to pull this whole stunt for the past 60 days? I don't, it's funny. Cause so we, we do, normal, just NBA stuff, non Nick stuff on our Patreon. And from the moment he asked out, I was like, I don't see the trade. Like, I think this ends like it did with Kobe in 07. Like he just goes back to his current situation. That might be a contender anyway. Um, The player empowerment era made me think that it's like 10% could happen. And you hit it with the unlikability though. And I almost wonder if like Knicks fans are now like we dodged a bullet. I think that would change if the the Nets actually win something this year. Um, I don't know where, where do you stand on, I guess, player empowerment, not necessarily as a concept. Cause I, I like it that the power has shifted, but it it can at a certain point be like you're under contract for four years, a contract you signed less than a year ago. Look, when it's millionaires, you're asking out. Yeah. When it's millionaires versus billionaires, Mm -hmm. I'm usually going to side with the, the David versus the Goliath. Right. Go get yours. Because in nine out of 10 situations, the company pushes you around or the billionaire, fat cats push you around, but there are fans in the middle of this thing. So I just feel like it was so much wasted breath. And like, we're almost lucky that Stephen A. Smith was gone the past month because <laughs> I couldn't have dealt with it, all of the, that, that stuff because uh-huh. to know that people were screaming and going nuts about Durant. And then at the end of the day, it's like, well, let's put my logo on it and Annette's logo and everyone's hunk of Dory and me and the Australian GM are boys. Like, yeah. are you, I don't know. Like it doesn't seem right. So, um, Player empowerment's great. Football, you saw it this year with Devontae Adams and you saw it with Tyreek Hill and like, I'm all for it. And uh, Lamar Jackson's in the midst of something right now where he's like, I'm going to bet on myself and I'm going to figure this out. And I think that's cool also. So um, I'm all for it within reason. I, as long as you don't disparage the the fans in the middle of it and get them involved where they're like, wait, do I like you? Do I not like you? Am I rooting for you? Am I not rooting for you? Like, you got to be at least cognizant of, you know, the room and uh, you know, I'm saying I'm probably not going to be invited on Rich Kleinman's podcast anytime soon, but I feel like I, I don't know if there was any consideration of like, there is a Nets fan base here and maybe can't handle this behind closed doors and not two minutes before free agency starts. Well, that's the other part that's I just, it's just never going to happen again. Like we all this stuff is public. All of it's part of the story. No. All of it's part of the coverage of the offseason. It's made it a 12 month sport, which like we we have our own Donovan Mitchell situation that. What is going weird. on there? I don't follow it day to day. Is he not so, a new cat? So I, I don't even want to say we have intel on this. We do have some connection. I say How we. How many times do you take batting practice with the Mets? Can you be a, well, that's, you be a Nick already? Like enough. 
as a Mets fan, it warms my heart and it makes Great. me it irrational. When, Go well, join the Knicks. It like it makes me irrational in what I personally would give up because like seeing him tweet about the Grom and all these other Mets things. It's like, OK, I would throw RJ in a deal. I would throw this person in that. Yeah. Like uh, the Knicks obviously have should be a little more uh uh, stern with their negotiations. So what it sounds like is for the first time, someone is entering negotiations with Danny Ainge and isn't desperate. And as much as Danny Ainge and his, I don't want to call him birdies, uh, but it's, it's, it, I'm trying to think who's the bald guy in game of Thrones. I'm blanking on his name right now. Oh, Lord Varys. Okay. okay. So as much as it, uh, Lord, he's kind of like Lord dragons. All right. You don't I do dragons. Do well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's almost like he's Lord Varys. For those who watch the show know who I'm talking about. And he's got his little birdies out there saying like he will win the trade. The Knicks are the desperate ones. The Knicks were done with their off season. They signed Jalen Brunson. Like they upgraded a point guard. Yep. And then the Timberwolves got desperate, traded all of these picks for Rudy Gobert. Yep. And it's like, I guess the summer of Donovan Mitchell is now. So they went into these negotiations with an offer. It sounds like they got close one night on an offer. And then Danny Ainge came back and said, well, you have to throw in one more thing. And Leon Rose was like, no, I'd actually rather. And was it RJ Barrett? No, no, no. It was like another unprotected pick because the Knicks don't only don't just want to make a trade for Donovan Mitchell. They also understand that that doesn't complete a championship roster. They then also want to have enough facets to make the next move. Right. So Listen, the Katie thing kind of held up the all of the negotiations That's what for Patrick everybody. Beverly was saying, like, you're holding up everybody, bro. Like, make a decision. So now that that's done, this some momentum might come now that there aren't seven other teams, yeah. you know, waiting to see what KD does before that. So like Phoenix might get involved. The the Heat might get involved. I don't see a team that can beat the Knicks offer. What is the Knicks offer exactly? I heard like so, six picks. That seems like a lot. So what Shams said the other day is two unprotected firsts, three protected firsts. So five first round picks total. And then Evan Fournier, Obi Toppin, and salary filler. Done. What are we talking about? Done. I, I, I look. I, I've watched well, the NBA draft the last several years. First round picks mean nothing anymore. It's so like, the the Jazz turned it down, though. The Jazz would like more, down. is what I'm saying. The Jazz, I think. Obi was a nice story. Get look, rid of him for Donovan Mitchell. <laughs> I'm a bit of an Obi. I'm an Obi Stan, and I like understand if the Knicks want to give up fewer unprotected picks, and because yeah. it's so hard to move Julius Randle. Ugh. Like Obi probably doesn't have. Where are we at with him now? It's complicated yeah. because he was such a revelation two years oh, ago and embraced the city. Kid, it was adorable, <laughs> right? And all those feelings went away because, like, one Obi fast break turns the garden back to the nineties, <laughs> and like he's a bit more efficient than Randall. All those long twos that were falling when nobody was allowed in the arena now aren't falling no. because everybody's in the arena. No. There were some effort questions last year. There's the thumbs down thing thumbs that down happened. Thing was so weird. And he just signed a four year extension. Know, so a lot of money. So it's tough to say that like we went into this offseason thinking like number one priority should be to trade Randall. Yeah. We went around to multiple other insiders, reporters from other fan bases. Like, do you want Julius Randall? Yeah. Do they want Julius and Randall? Is there a market? We just couldn't find a deal. Yeah. So now that the Katie, the Katie conversation's done, there was a report that um, Phoenix might be looking for a power forward. So there's okay. the pipe dream that maybe they're interested right. in Julius Randall. There's a Charlotte deal out there because of what's happened to Miles Bridges um, that they might be in the market for somebody that they can at least have under contract for the next four years. That doesn't. I like happen. Mitchell, man. I like Mitchell. I think I Mitchell- do too. Yeah points there's a local tie obviously where there's pops and all that and like i don't i don't know the N- the nba eastern conference at boston went from being a whatever team mm-hmm. to like suddenly in the finals this year like i feel like the knicks are not that far away if rj you if randall gets his act together and then who knows you bring donovan mitchell and you also have brunson like that's a good four so here's here's where i stand now and it's one thing that i I think some Knicks fans are forgetting is just how good Donovan Mitchell is. Two years ago with him as their best player, the Jazz were the one seed. Like the one Knicks seed. haven't been a one seed since 2000. Oh, excuse me, since 1993. Excuse me, 1994. So it's tough for me to turn down something that would make the Knicks immediately a one seed or not even a one seed, but just like have a guy that's that good. Um, and I think because the ceiling doesn't make them a championship contender, there's the hesitation, like you don't throw that type of deal in. There's also like a, because our kids are homegrown, we are less 
uh, likely to want to trade them or want to get yeah. rid of them. Like Deuce McBride. like so, Deuce McBride is an untouchable to some people. Quentin Grimes is an untouchable to some people. I will also say, in defense of some Who's of those the other kid from Kentucky, the point guard. Mo- uh, Who did we get from Kentucky a couple of years ago? Oh, we got a couple. Look, Kevin Knox was a Kentucky guy. Not that's Knox. Who's that's now in. Ball? Not Grimes. There's another guy. Oh, Manuel Quickly. quickly. Manuel yeah. Quickly. Now, Quickly, I think would actually be a perfect six man on the Knicks. There's a movement out there that thinks that he could be a starter slash all star. I'm I'm not there yet, but I don't want to completely disqualify it because there is some math to support a high volume version of him. Yep. What I will say is like there is a team construction issue if you put Randall, Barrett. Mitchell and Brunson on the floor together. Too many it's shots. Just, there's just one basketball. Like I don't, I don't see how like Barrett has been good off ball once, but he's much better on ball. Same thing for Jalen Brunson. I'm peppering you with questions because you're the expert. Oh, I believe me. I'm happy to answer. Bar- Barrett disappointment. Oh, not at all. Exceeding expectations. I mean, I thought coming out of Duke, this was you know when they took him what fifth, fourth overall. I thought this guy was going to be a sensation. He's had his moments, but you guys are happy with Barrett. Well, so for the happiness, depends who you ask. What yeah. I'll say is the tough part about the draft class he's in is it's Zion. So it's just pure talent was clearly far and away. Number one, Ja has the talent and walked into a situation that's perfect for him. The guy was second team all NBA last year and his team was 20 and five when he didn't yeah. play. Um, and then Darius Garland has walked into a competent situation. Really good. The situations RJ has been in his first year. He was on the court with seven other forwards at the same time. So it was tough to find like any type of spacing. So his like any type of development that was supposed to happen. Why can't he make free throws? Well, that's something he's just personally got to work on. But like, but the three, the three point shot was really good. His second year, it took a step back. And as his volume went up, some of his accuracy, his efficiency went down. But I think the fact that he gets to the line is one of my bigger takeaway because free throw improvement can improve with time and with practice. Uh, the fact that you're getting to the line, your free throw rate is the thing that you want to look you know at. Who would have been a great Nick in the '90s and would have fit that mold? Number sixty-seven, Taj Gibson. Taj Gibson, yeah, a man after all. We have a shirt at our merch store that's like I gotta get an that OG. You know what? It's not believe me, it's on us. But the fact that Taj like was a Tibbs guy and and was like Obi's mentor for two years is like why he means so much to us. Always making the right play. Always yes, like always instilling. getting the offensive rebound. The hustle. Yeah, play. yeah. That's what the Knicks are. And I know that sounds cliche. And no, cool, that's what we grew up on. Yeah. Cool. Like, that's it. Like, I, you know, they weren't dirty, but, you know, no one was getting in that paint when Mason and Xavier McDaniel were on the court. And mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I feel like the Knicks the last few years have shown glimpses of that. But I like that Taj Gibson was that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I will say for RJ, like after the All-Star break, when they kind of gave him more yeah. duties with the ball raised his his usage rate um we're talking a guy averaging close to 24 a game um imagine that for a full season which no, is why wait. the argument for ran that when he averaged the second half of the season it was a, it was like 23 and change yeah great for him i didn't know that yeah so cool. like high volume rj is what you want to see and you want to see high rj high volume rj without like julius oh, randall who clogs the paint martin mitchell robinson always down and you can't have yeah. so much of your team needing the ball or not having a perimeter game, which is a defense for keeping Obi Toppin, which is why there's so much team construction that's going into it. the negotiations for Donovan Mitchell. There's nothing those possessions where Julius Randle dribbles for 11 times mm-hmm. and then hoists up a left-handed three-pointer and you're like, what? what, what yeah. What like, oh, what's that? even worse is the left-handed long two because oh, I'll, I'll like, understand if you're three. taking a three, if you're it's taking a long, long two yeah, or like, a fadeaway. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's the state of the Knicks right now. We're waiting on Donovan Mitchell. How was summer league returns? Everyone felt good or was it? When, like- so that's the other part. One of the other guys that apparently Utah is interested in is a kid named Quentin Grimes who could like made the all summer league team looks really good creating, which they didn't think he had that coming out of college. I thought he was just like a spot up. Where's he out of school? Do you know, offhand? Houston. He went to Houston. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And we had a, uh, so the guy who writes our newsletter, John, um, had Quentin Grimes' his trainer. I could send you the link. I love it. Um, to the newsletter, but like had him on to uh, just talk about what he's working on this offseason. And it's mostly 
creativity. So that way he's not just like a spot up three point shooter. It's a guy that actually Great. could do things with the ball. The Knicks have a lot of good young prospects. Trade his ass for Mitchell. Get but that's the thing is, 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 is a guy that's going to end up on another team someday. <laughs> um, so we'll see the next couple of weeks. Will probably be the Donovan Mitchell sweepstakes again, um, but we'll and see. And we're still in. Last one for me. We're still in with the coach. You know that stuff wears thin after a year. Ever um, <laughs> again, depends who you ask. Yeah. Um, I, man, I wish. So our regular host John is on vacation, but he is the biggest, Must be nice. <laughs> a big, the biggest Tibbs defender. Okay. Um, I personally think it's last season got frustrating because he was doing everything he always does, like playing veterans over yep. kids, playing the guys he thinks are ready to help you win over other ones. And I think he held on to the Alec Burks and the Taj Gibson and the, the, the older veteran leash too long when you had younger energy because the Knicks needed to play at pace to have any type of chance of to win last year. And if you're you know running these veterans for 38, 40 minutes a game, they're going to get exhausted and you might need an Obi Toppin or an Emmanuel quickly. And it's funny, Pete, the moment, the moment he made the switch later in the season because they decided to prioritize um, development, like to Emmanuel quickly and Obi Toppin, the the kids started helping them win games. They finished like nine and five to end the season. And it was like, oh, so this could have been the whole year. Because Mayo he, quickly playing 20 minutes a game. And he's he in Chicago. Some, it, got, it got hot. And at the end, and it was like the young players didn't respond. And then Minnesota was even worse, right? Well, so the, there's, there's two different things there. The, the Chicago thing, like, it started hot because he had a guy. Like, he's, it, Tibbs has never had a guy. guy. Right. Like, yeah. he's never had a guy to really, like, front run his offense that he just doesn't have to worry. Like, what Tibbs is, is I've always compared him to Rex Ryan. He's a defensive coordinator, a genius at that. And yeah. if Rex got paired with the right QB, I'm convinced he'd still be coaching sure. right now. But he never did and didn't have someone to really develop Mark Sanchez into what anything Sanchez could yeah. become. And Tibbs has only had Derrick Rose for really two years. Yep. And since then, like he had Jimmy Butler for a year, but Jimmy just like did not want to play in Minnesota. <laughs> you could say Carl Anthony Towns was too young to be that guy. Yeah. Um like Andrew Wiggins obviously wasn't ready to be. He's really he Golden State and looks like he's all world. Yeah, we were we were ready for Andrew Wiggins to be the third guy. But there's a way team, that you know, I, I cover the NFL and there's a way that Cliff Kingsbury and Sean McVay and Kevin O'Connell speak to their players. And there's mm-hmm. a way that the guys from 15 years ago treated their players. And I think the today's generation might respond better to the former rather than the latter. And I know that sounds kind of antithetical to you know you've got Steve Kerr coaching and you've got it, but like. I look at the coach up in Boston and how mm-hmm. he operates. I look at that young coach in Minnesota. I like him. Um, I, do too. I feel like there's like a youth movement at the coaching position and I'm not an ageist by any means, but uh-huh. is this guy the one to connect with these young players? And if not, is it time to move on? I, I will say every kid on the team swears by him. Okay. Like RJ swears by him quickly, swears by him. Obi swears and the by Patriots him. Rookies love Belichick. So right. It, so it's, it, it's, it's cool. I, I will say if they get off to like a six and 18 start, I think their assistant coach, Johnny Bryant, who came yep. from Utah, yep. um, will be the head coach. Okay. Um, and look, Johnny Bryant is also a reason why a lot of Knicks fans think the Donovan, Donovan Mitchell to the yeah. Knicks is. But I also want to see what Tibbs looks like when he has an offensive guy. I mean, I thought it could be Jalen Brunson. Um, and now if it's Brunson and Donovan Mitchell, awesome. like, I'd like to see what the best defensive coach this side of you may of a uh, of uh, the Raptors coach. I'm blanking on his name. Um, but outside oh, uh, of nurse, Nick yeah, nurse. Nick nurse outside of Nick yeah. nurse or like an Ime Udoka, like the better defensive minded coaches that like have an offensive philosophy, but they're really more focused on stopping you from scoring. I like to see what that looks like with Tibbs. Yeah. For all we know, like it'll, it'll happen. The trade will happen and it still will lead to Johnny Bryant being the head coach anyway. Right. Um, but look, so it's funny you bring up the nineties as like the, the time that we grew up watching the team and loving the team. It's because it was all about basketball. It's X's and O's. And for the last 20 years, aside from the mellow saga, like it's mostly been about, well, like, did Charles Oakley get it, get tossed out by security? Did Did Derrick Rose just put on 30 or 40 pounds? Right. Like it's, it's all like, like did James Dolan go on ESPN radio and it's this other distractions. I do think we're at a point, which is what I've been telling some Knicks fans that 
some of my Knicks fans, friends that have like stopped watching basketball, they're like, do yeah. I dare tap back in? And it's like, now it's really all about X's and O's. It's all about roster construction. And so dude, it's a great all transition that stuff, you know? because I think they're a lot further, a lot further away than what you guys are, but that's where the jets are right now. And I would okay. tell that to jets fans that this last draft class, not only did they get three first round picks, but Brees Hall was considered a fourth uh, first round pick. And I know Joe Douglas well, and he told me he was trying to trade up at the end of the first round to get him mm. they got him in the second round. And there's this kid, Michael Clemens, who's a defensive lineman at a Texas A&M who missed the senior bowl because he wasn't feeling too hot and didn't get a chance to do that. And then he slips to day three and he's a beast also. So like the Jets have five different guys. Then you add in Rucker, who's going to be a tight end, six that are in this draft class alone. And Salah is as likable and as rootable a coach as you'll find in the league. So like they're not going to win a ton of games this year, the jets, mm-hmm. and maybe you don't want to tap in and waste your Sundays at, you know, one o'clock watching them lose to the bills and the dolphins and the Patriots this year. But if there is a time to get in from the ground up, and I know they've heard this the last decade, like jets fans, like this is a very, very promising future with this team. And that's without me even talking about the quarterback. who I'm not sure on yet. Yeah. That's the thing I was going to ask you is like, so I have two friends I want to shout out. My buddy, so friend of the pod, his name is Yash, who is as optimistic a Jets fan as you'll find, was on the 10 and 7 bandwagon for the Jets until Very the Wilson, optimistic. Yeah, until the Wilson injury. Yeah. And then even with Flacco and then well, the, the Becton injury, honestly, the, the deflated his 10 and 7 more than anything else. But um I just want to know, like, like I wore Jet Green for this like pod it. in particular. Respect um it. and I like, what is the reason for me to not be the same old dejected Jets fan? Oh, because it's a whole different feeling in the building. The GM okay, and good. coach are on the same page. Like, they understand. Like, I will tell you this. It might be five wins this year. It might be six okay. wins this year. But know that just like what we saw in L.A., like, it took a little while. In San Francisco, it takes a little while. And they believe in Wilson. Now, the injury is a setback, but, like, they like him. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you that. I haven't any proof that he's the real deal, but they like him. And, like, at the very least, this isn't, you know, uh, an old team that is, you know, playing with like crappy veterans and they're going to be mediocre over here. They're, they're building something and they drafted really well. And the fan base, which hasn't seen a playoff, you know, birth since the Rex Ryan years, obviously, and hasn't seen a team that's been truly easy to root for maybe since those squads. Like, I think you're going to want to root for Garrett Wilson. You're going to want to root for Sauce Gardner. Mm-hmm. Like, I, they're good dudes and they're good players. And that Rex Ryan team was built on, you know, the backs of, you know, Revis, obviously, but a lot of different young players that had come along and kind of blossomed at the same time. And yeah. Then, that know, offensive yeah. line of first rounders is Making so underrated. Goals. Yeah. Uh, and all that, like those guys were legends. Yeah. And um, I don't know what the jets are going to be this year. And I actually think between us and your listeners, like I don't think the loss of Wilson for Flacco at the start of the season is as drastic as it's being made out to be. Flacco can play right now. We're still not sure where Wilson's at with the playbook. We're still not sure whether Wilson's going to be able to take it. Wilson's probably uh, 2023. Let's look for the big jump anyway. Um, as much as we've heard great things, like Flacco can hold his own and Flacco mm. can be just fine. Um, it's going to be a tough year. The AFC is absolutely loaded. The AFC East is absolutely loaded. So I don't see a ton of wins but I think there's promising returns and I would almost focus on the next 18 months as opposed to the next like three months. So the other Jets fan, I'm going to shout out um, my buddy, Evan, he's a teacher in Queens and he's the, he's the fellow pessimistic Jets yeah. fan and his mom works at Clemson. So he grew up like wow. a, a Trevor, La- like a Clemson fan. And when the Trevor Lawrence sweepstakes were happening, it was his dream come true that yeah. like, this guy's going to be a jet. And then yeah. with three weeks to go, it gets ruined. They beat the um, Rams in a non uh, nothing game. game. And nothing. I'm the one that's like, just nail the two pick. But yeah. like, yeah. I also understand from his perspective, like you have the right to be upset, but he's even been starting to get me a little more optimistic about Zach. Um, I, my hope for this season is way less about how many games they win. I just don't want like 27, nothing at the Raiders. I don't, I don't want blowouts. Like get it. The give me the game was last night and it wasn't the starters, but like that felt like a Jets game the last few years. And it's like, right. that be acceptable. They, they cannot come out to another field and just be the worst team every single time. Like at least put up a fight and there are flashes, you know, Wilson played well the last few games last year. And, I honestly think there's going to be a spirit and fervor to this team. And they're going to start like living and breathing the Sala style, which is like, you know, you know, his thing. it's all gas, no mm-hmm. break. 
again, they're not a playoff team this year. I'll put that on and I'm not being critical. I just don't see it in the AFC, but there will be great strides, I think, from a lot of those individual players. Right. I'm looking for, give me the lion season from last year where they had 11 sure. covers, you know, like I'll, I'll settle for close games. In the game, ju- yeah. Like Justin Tucker has to hit a record setting field yeah. to beat me. That's I'll take that. The game was competitive and watchable into the fourth quarter. Um, I would be uh, not a good uh, host of the show. If I didn't also ask for on behalf of giants fans, yeah. the last question um what do you think about Dable? Is yeah. this the, the last chance for Daniel Jones? Can you I'm fix not him? As, I'm not as optimistic on the Giants this year okay. because I feel like there's a lot of transition. And this is year two of Sala and year three of Douglas, where they're like, all right, this is our plan in motion. Joe Shane is a fantastic GM and is going to be fantastic at his job. And Brian Dable, I think, is the right guy, but there's a lot of stuff they have to still undo from the last few years and the previous regimes and the previous contracts that were signed. So uh, I don't know if Daniel Jones is the quarterback next year. He gets the, gets a chance this year to prove that he is. And the only way that he can really prove it is by being undeniable and being awesome. So you actually know going into this season when they didn't pick up his contract option that like the Giants basically said, like, go prove it to us. And if he isn't, he isn't, he'll go somewhere else and that's fine. And they'll start again. But I mean, Saquon, Saquon's not playing in these preseason games. It's like, all right, like we're still on ice. Like what do we do? So I, I don't know. I, there's, there is a lot to be undone contract wise, roster construction wise from the previous regime that I can't say with great uh, enthusiasm that the giants are going to turn it around this season. Again, next season might be the year. Could it be a, a hint of a, because their division, I guess their division isn't as weak as oh, it used to be. They could win it. No, yeah, they absolutely okay. could win it. And the, the NFC is so wide open. If the Jets were in the NFC, I'd be singing a different tune. The NFC mm. is completely wide open. And, you know, like I said, Brian Dable and Mike Kafka, who's the offensive coordinator, Kafka was with Mahomes the last two years, learning from Andy Reid. Like, you're not going to get two better offensive young minds than Dable and Kafka. If they can't get it out of Daniel Jones, I don't have much confidence that anyone can. Okay. Well, Giants fans, I hope you got some closure or got like what you heard. Um, if you're a Jets fan, I I hope you're you like the optimistic tune that that Pete is singing to at least the future of the Jets, wait, whether wait, the present or you, not is, is do you home. go to these Knicks games or you so, watch at home? We watch at home. We watch at home. Yeah, because we do these post game live, live streams. Do live tweet, live stream. We live tweet and we then we live stream afterwards on our YouTube channel. Yeah. All right. I gotta follow all of it. Uh I go to a couple of Knicks games a year. My hours are crazy. I gotta be up at 4 a.m. every morning. So I don't go to a lot of the evening games, but sometimes during March and April, they've got those Sunday afternoon games. I'll get mm-hmm. to them. And I went to the last few years, Martin Luther King Day games. Last year was against the Hornets. I love going to the garden. If you're ever at the garden. And I'm there. I would love to, you know, get it. Absolutely. Gift. In fact, I'm I might be kind of announcing something right now. So last year we did a an event with MSG where we actually got to watch a game in a suite. And it was like presented by MSG, a bunch of our Wait. followers, and we got to watch a game with a bunch of our fans. Maybe that's the game that we get like to, that. to meet. All due respect to Wally Zerbiak and whoever else is in the booth. Uh, I would be fine with you guys on MSG and actual hey. fans as well. Let's go. <laughs> Absolutely. Peter Schrager, ladies and gentlemen, before you get going, if anybody has no idea where to find you, please tell yeah. the folks where they can find you. Uh, my Twitter handle, I don't do Instagram. My Twitter handle is at P S C H R A G S. And then I host the morning show on NFL network every day, seven to 10 on NFL network. Uh, our show is a little different. It's not just ball. We talk NBA, we talk uh, pop culture, we talk all sorts of shit. So uh, my game of Thrones uh, reference aside, I, uh, I can usually hang with most things and uh, I appreciate being on. This is awesome. Absolutely. Thank you, Pete. Thank you.